today. It's an amazing day. Uh, we're going to continue to talk about uh, our series. We're in the second week of our series, series The Vow, and uh, it is about uh, the, the vows that we make in relationships and the vows that we make in marriage. And last week, we made a, a vow to, to a vow of priority, right? So we want to put God as our number one and our spouse as our number two. And if, and if you're single here today and your first time here, you're going, oh, great, they're talking marriage. Tune out. No, don't tune out. Because I want to encourage you this morning that if you are, are in this place of, of, you know, dating relationship or, or someday, you know, your prince will come, that kind of a thing, um, I want to just encourage you to prepare yourself to make sure that the Lord is your priority now in preparation for your two someday. So I just wanted to let you know that so that when you think about all these things and we talk about all this stuff today and for the next couple of weeks, just remember that this is all, you can, you can apply it um, and, and, and fit it into your life right now as a preparation for what's to come. Uh, because it's important that we prepare before so that, so that things become habit um, when we're in the middle of them, right? So, I want to just ask this question uh, for starters. Who has made a fool out of themselves for love? Yeah? Yeah? Awesome. I mean, you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? That, that, that crazy stuff that you just do because you're just so goo-goo-gaga over that other person. The things you're willing to do. I, I just remember a few times that, that Jill, when we were dating, she was like, I just love walking in the rain. She doesn't love walking in the rain. I don't love walking in the rain. But for some random weird reason, we were dating, she's like, let's go walk in the rain. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> rain is cold and wet, especially at 11 o'clock at night, which I, you stay up later than you normally do, right, when you're, when you're in, that, in that dating time. It's like, who stays up till one o'clock in the morning and then goes to work and gets ready to, to, to teach Sunday school on the next day? I mean, this is just crazy stuff. You're like staying up till two or three o'clock in the morning, just hanging out because you can't get enough of the other person. You just want to be in the... <laughs> yeah. Do goofy, crazy stuff. I mean, you know, you might drive overnight to go see that person or, or spend all of your paycheck on that concert, you know, or that, that, that your that you're, girlfriend or boyfriend really loves. You just, you sit on the phone forever going, you hang up. No, nah, 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 you hang up. You. <laughs> I can't, you. <laughs> you just, it's so goofy. It's so goofy. But I remember one time, and, and Jill can tell the story too. It, it, it's her story actually, but I'm going to share it anyway. Um, so, so she had just She'd gone to Denver for uh, a wedding, and she was up there, and she had said to her family, I think I met the guy that I could marry. Now, they say that it's, she was saying, this is the guy she's going to marry. She says, could be, he's that kind of a guy that I could marry. Okay, so, so she's up there, and she's at this wedding, and we had just spent a month hanging out together in July, and this was like the first week in, weekend in August, and she was up in Denver. She drove back, even though she could have stayed up in Denver a little bit longer, she drove back down to Durango to be in church, and when I was done with Sunday school, I was coming, walking in from the underground, and there she was, sitting right there. Ben, I think she was sitting right where you are. And so I walk in, and she's just sitting there. She's looking fine. <laughs> and I'm walking, and I went, Pfft. you can't tell by the way I use my walk. I'm a woman. No, I'm just, <laughs> I, was, I was on it. Totally tripped over the chairs, made a fool out of myself. No. But she did what it took because she was like, I like this guy. I want to make sure that, that we hang out together. And, and really, we, we, we spent a great afternoon together, just the two of us. It was, in many ways, kind of our, our, our first date together, just the two of us. And it was really, really cool. Um, but by nature, we pursue what we don't have. And so when we're, we're in this moment of, of really longing after that, that, that special someone, we'll do crazy things, don't we? We, we, we write notes, we put them on windshields, we, we will, you know, 
listen to music that we, that we don't like or, you know, it's just whatever it takes. You know, we'll, we'll, for me, it was like she used to work at this store that no longer exists on Main Street, like, like many stores that don't exist on Main Street anymore. But uh, she worked at this store called The West. And I remember going into the store right about the time, just, just before it would close, and I remember helping her clean up the store to close so that we could get out of there. Who hangs out to help clean up a store? <laughs> somebody who is pursuing somebody else. We do this. We do this. But sadly, what happens after time? After time, you know, eventually couples get married, they spend more time together, and eventually that you caught the person, right? You've pursued them, and then after time you stop pursuing and that's very, very sad. It, it becomes kind of this, this lazy response to the relationship. And today, I want to just talk to us about this idea of always pursuing your number two. Always pursuing your number two. Because if you're lazy in, in taking care of different things, let's, let's, let's get real, things start to kind of fall apart. If you're lazy in your business, your business starts to kind of tank. If you're lazy in taking care of your body, you start to Get squishy. Thank you, Tana. <laughs> I was going to say soft, but, you know, squishy works. It's all good. Yeah, when we get lazy, we, we start to tend to, to, to fall short in these areas. If we're not taking care of our grass, it starts to get brown, right? Well, pretty soon, if we're not taking care of our own grass, we start looking at somebody else's grass. We go, man, that's really pretty. I want to start getting on that other person's grass. And we start to look at the grass in our neighbor's yard, and we go, man, that's looking really nice. Well, if we start to think that the grass is greener on the other side of the fence, I want to just encourage you to start watering your own grass. <laughs> you kind of know where I'm talking. The same thing is true in relationships, right? If you didn't know what I was talking about there. Many times if we get lazy in our pursuing our number two, then we can start to think that everybody else is better. And my challenge this morning is that if you are vowing to pursue your two, it'll be very difficult to think that the grass on the other side of the, of the fence is greener than what you already have. So I encourage you this morning um, with this. In Genesis 2.24, we hit this verse last week. It says, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. We talked about the word leaves last week, right? This week, I want to look at the word united. Underline that word united, because this word right here, uh, united, in the, in the Hebrew, the root word is dabak. It kind of sounds Klingon, um, if, you're a, if you're a Trekkie. Um, but uh, it means this. It means to cling or adhere, okay? To catch by pursuit, all right? Or to pursue with hard affection and devotion. So when we read this verse of that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, it's talking about this, this pursuit, this clinging or adhering, this, this coming together for serious intention. It's not just this thing of like holding hands and... and Kumbaya, now we're united. This is a major action. It's a beautiful, beautiful word. And I want to just share with you some other uh, translated passages of Scripture that have this dabak as a root word in this, okay? In Psalm 63, 8, it says, I follow close behind you. All right? That's a stalker's favorite verse. But um, it's, no, I, no, that's bad. I'm sorry. Um, but uh, I follow close behind you, Psalm 63, 8. In Job 41, 17, it says, they are joined fast to one another. They cling together and cannot be parted. In Judges 20, 45, they pursued hard after them. There's something very um, passionate and very uh, um, special about this word dabak. And so when we talk about this, it, it goes beyond just this very simple being united. It's a very active word. 
And I love when, when we read into Scripture and we start to look at, at these different verses and different words and how um, in Hebrew there is just such a, an action and a picture that is painted because of the, the, the word that's brought. And so I want you to just think about that when you read these verses and we bring these up, that uh, there's just so much more richness to the Scripture. All right? There's a, there's a great story in the Old Testament about pursuit, and it's the story of Jacob and Rachel. If you're familiar with this story, Jacob goes out and he's, he finds this, this beautiful woman named Rachel. And it says that Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. And he's going, bonjour. I like you. It also says that, that Rachel had a sister named Leah. And Leah, well, she was weak in the eyes. So basically what that's translated as saying is that Rachel was a little, a, a real hottie, and Leah, well, she had a good personality. <laughs> no, she just needed glasses, that's all. And, um, but Jacob worked for seven years. He pursued Rachel for seven years. And after that seven years, her dad gave, this, gave, gave, gave Jacob his bride, and when Jacob opened, you know, took off the veil, he saw that he had married Leah. And he goes to, to Laban, he goes, Laban, what, what's the deal? You know, I, I agreed to work for you seven years so that, so that I could marry Rachel. And, and he goes, well, the dad goes, well, the tradition custom is, is that we have to marry the older daughter first before we marry the younger daughter off. And so um, a lot of people will say that uh, then Jacob worked and agreed to work another seven years to marry Rachel. In reality, what happened was is that Laban actually gave Rachel to Jacob at that point, but then he agreed to work another seven years. So he worked for what he already had. When we are in relationships and we have this amazing person that we saw and we pursued and we married, we need to continue to work at pursuing them, even though we already have them. We need to always promise to pursue our number two. And just to, to remind you guys, right, we, we, we made the vow last week about, you know, keeping God number one and our spouse number two. So when I say that we're pursuing our number two, that's what I mean, right? Because we should be putting God first. So we're pursuing our number two. If you're not married today, I want to just encourage you with something, that uh, this, this whole idea of pursuit is very, very important. If you are involved in a relationship, ladies, where the guy never puts on a good pair of jeans and spends a little money on you and takes you out or doesn't buy you flowers, but just kind of loafs and is a blob on your couch all the time, you might want to consider... The, yeah, okay. <laughs> For those of you that are on streaming, you heard, they heard get rid of him on, you know, in the eyes. Um, but uh, you might want to consider changing some things up there. Um, guys, same thing. There has to be some reciprocated pursuit going on if it is just somebody that is just sapping the life and you're in the dating place, just understand that, that Whatever is going on before marriage, it will continue on and probably get even greater exponentially after you get married. So if you have this person before who's not pursuing you and you're just holding on tight to them, it might be the situation that you need to start to let them go because they are not pursuing you. And if they're not pursuing you, they're not worth it. Because listen to me, ladies, you are worth pursuing. And if you are not being pursued, peace out. <laughs> peace out. All right? This morning, I want to talk about this, this idea of pursuit, pursuing each other and closing this gap between intentions and actions. Because we have always a lot of great intentions, right? But oftentimes, our actions don't speak to the same ideas that we have in our mind. We tend to think about a lot of things, but we don't 
take action to them. And I want to just have uh, a couple moments here that we can discuss this idea and having just, just some, some different, um, I don't know, tools that, that we can use to um, bridge that gap between intentions and actions. The first one is that when you think something good, say it. When you think something good, say it. Write that down. Hold on to that. All right? In Hebrews 3.13, it says, But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Now, when I read this verse, for many of us, when we read these verses and and other verses that I'm going to share today, we tend to think of, like last week, the love your neighbor as yourself. You think of everybody else but the people that are in your house. But our neighbor... Our closest neighbor should be the one that is sleeping next to us. And so the reality is when we talk about these things, this person here, whichever side they sleep on, you know, they need to be placed in this position of priority and placed in this position of understanding that they need to be pursued. And when you think of something good, you need to say it, but encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. You know what I mean by, by when you think something good, say it, right? When you think of that, that thing to, to share, make sure, make sure you just express that. Make sure that you're, you're sharing, you're saying the things that, that, that are positive, that you're encouraging your, your loved one. Guys, in your, in your pursuit through words, I want to encourage you today to pursue her with words of affection. Pursue her with words of affection. Now, I'm not meaning sexual affection when I talk about these words, okay? Okay. If you have young people in the room and you don't want them to hear that word, you might want to plug their ears, but understand, this is an okay word to say, all right? Sexual, not affection. I I mean, either one, it's good to say. But pursue her with words of affection, non-sexual affectionate words. Now, guys, you, you know what I mean by this, because we can change anything into sexual affection words, right? It's like, hey, can you mow the lawn? Yeah, I'll mow your lawn. right? Or hey, can, the, the, the car's empty. Can you fill it with gas? Yeah, I'll fill it with gas. It's crazy what guys can say, but I want to encourage you guys, non-sexual affectionate words. I want you to, to use this as a tool today. Take this as a template. I love you because. Don't just say the words I love you. They're great. They're great in and of themselves. And the words, I love you, I know that, that some people rarely hear those words. And so if, if you rarely hear the words and you hear them, it's very special. But guys, you need to say, I love you because you make my day brighter. I love you because uh, whatever it is, you're so much fun. I love you because you're so self-sacrificing. I love you because of, of the way that you, you, you raise our kids. I love you because you are my best friend. I love you because you honor God. Whatever it is, I love you because fill in the blank. Guys, pursue your ladies with words of affection. And ladies, pursue him with words of affirmation. We guys need to, need to hear that we, we did a good job. We're kind of like um, a golden retriever. Okay? If we, if we bring you a stick, tell us we did a good job. We need to hear it. We need to hear that, 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 that what we did was well done. I, I got to tell you, I, I like hearing that, that, I, that, I, that I spoke a good word. But when Jill says to me, man, that was really good today. Woo! When she comes up to me and she goes, you know, Mark, I really loved how you did the dishes. That was awesome. Yeah? I can make them cleaner. She knows all these tricks. And I hate it. <laughs> Don't tell him what he's not. But tell him that what you tell him who you see him becoming. 
The biggest thing, if you want to see your man be the spiritual head of your home, and he is not one of these guys who prays, but out of the blue, he decides to pray for dinner, man, pray, praise him. After that, after that prayer at Thanksgiving, and he goes, uh, Jesus, um, you're good, and thanks for the food, Amen. You go up to him later and you say, I love that prayer. That was so special. And you don't, don't patronize, but, but be real. But go, I loved it. Thank you for praying. It meant so much to hear you pray over the food for our family. Thank you. Encourage them. Don't tell him what he's not, but tell him who you see him becoming. Men, she wants to know, do you love me today? And ladies, he wants to know, do you believe in me today? So as we're walking this life out of pursuing one another, when you think something good, say it. And secondly, when you think something special, do it. When you think something special, do it. Loosely translating James 4.17, if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin to them. Folks, I gotta tell you today that if you're in, in this place where the two of you have young kids, babies, and you hear, guys, you hear your, your, your little one crying in the middle of the night, and the first inclination is for you to get up and take care of that little baby, I wanna encourage you to do it. Don't justify the fact that you can't feed them and so you're just going to stay in bed or justify the fact that, well, I have to work in the morning so, you know, I'm going to let her get them. If you feel as you hear that baby, wake up, take care. If you think something special, do it. If you think, you know what, I wonder if, if, if my spouse is going to just, I wonder if she'd like some flowers. Do it. Do it. If you think something special, do it. Guys, Moms love it when you bathe the kids, man. When you take care, doing the dishes. And I know that even doing the dishes doesn't seem like a special thing. But when your spouse's love language is acts of service and you start doing acts of service for them, oh my goodness, it's transformational. It is something special. If you think something special, do it. Do it. Fill the tank with gas. Write a thoughtful note. Make the bed. Guys, watch a chick flick. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> what's, what's, that, what's that nun show? The, the baby midwife. Call the midwives. Ugh. <laughs> Guys, watch Call the Midwives. <laughs> <laughs> I don't watch it. Um, <laughs> but I love her anyway. I, I've watched it like once. <laughs> Maybe half of a show. Um, I fell asleep. But, or girls, ladies, watch a shoot 'em up with shoot 'em up action flick with your, with your man. I mean, whatever it is. But when you think of something special, do it. Do it. Do something your spouse loves. If your spouse loves to golf, I want to encourage you to, to go golfing with your spouse. If your spouse just loves holding babies and serving in, in kids' ministry, then I would encourage you guys, go with your spouse and serve in kids' ministry with your wives. I got to tell you, there's something so cool when I see a husband and wife, a couple, serving together in our kids' ministry. It is just, it is a very special thing. And just, just to give a shout out, I saw some, some couples this week serving in, in um, just, just Adventure Bible Camp and doing that together, and it was such a cool thing to see these couples do it. And it was just, it was special. So anyway, if you think of something good, say it. If you think something special, do it. And when you want something different, be it. Be it. If you start to think of of these words and say these words in, in your head, well, man, if she would only, or if my husband would just, I want you to understand something. The only one that you have control over in your life is yourself. 
Honestly, you don't have control over anybody else. You may think that you can, you can dominate or you can do all of these things which are completely wrong, but the only one that you have control over is yourself. So don't gripe about what your spouse is not. Instead, continue to grow into who you are supposed to be. What do I mean by this? Well, let's say that, that your spouse is constantly on their phone. They're texting, they're surfing the internet, they're, they're looking on Facebook, they're Instagramming, they're doing all of these things. Um, I've, I've heard of one couple where, where the, the husband was constantly doing this and constantly on his phone, he's just super busy all the time. And the wife, instead of getting after him saying, you're always on your phone, just get off your phone, engage with the kids. She put her phone away. She didn't get on her phone. And she started really pressing into the relationships with her kids. She really started to engage in the needs of her husband. She started to engage in the needs of the, of the kids. She, she didn't engage in the needs of her phone, but she started to really actively talk, pursue the relationships that were in front of her. And in response to this, her husband, seeing that she had put the phone down at dinner time, that the phone wasn't around in the evening time, that the phone wasn't involved in anything, he began to recognize this, and he started to put the phone away himself. I know of a couple in this church that actually, if they were here today, I was going to have him come up, but, but he wanted to improve in their marriage relationship. And so he asked his wife to make a list. And he, she put down stuff, and he thought things were good. But then she started to write things down on that list, and he goes, wow, I'm actually not doing that. I'm not doing that great. But he started to do the things that he could do to be different, to make the relationship alive and exciting. He put in the work. He pursued. He didn't just let his grass die, but he started to water his grass, and he started to pursue his wife. And I got to tell you that their life together in marriage is richer and more fulfilling than it's ever been. And he will tell you that because he put in the work. He decided that he would be different. So I want to encourage you this morning to do these things. I want to invite the worship team back up. Guys, this is, this is a big deal, and this is not just something that, uh, that we're talking about marriage and, and just trying to, to form some, some scripture, put some scripture into this. This was modeled first by Jesus. All right? And when we read about what God did, what God so loved the world, right, that he gave his one and only son, when we talk about this stuff, and Jesus talks about the shepherd who leaves the 99 to go after the one, understand that there is a desire in God to pursue his loved ones. And he doesn't just stop when you give your life over to the Lord. He continues to pursue. He continues to go after he doesn't just leave you alone because he loves you. He sent his son to die for you. That is a passionate pursuit. You know, for the, the past couple of weeks, we, we've sung this song about the reckless love of God. And I, and I have to tell you, like Mark Jones has shared, we're not going to sing that song today because we have sang it for a couple of weeks. But, but here's the thing with that song that... that um, has changed my heart. You hear it on K-Love right now. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a popular song. But I was so frustrated with it because I was like, God's not reckless. God is a God of order. It made sense to me to sing instead of reckless love of God, passionate love of God. Because I saw that his passion was so deep that he would leave the 99 to go after the one. But when I started to reflect on not how God sees the situation, but how man sees the situation, all of a sudden this song took on a different meaning for me. And I started to break down and cry because of the reckless love that God has for us. That he's willing to let the 99 go to save the one who's lost who could be dying, 
who could be injured, who could be in pain. Folks, I got to tell you that in your relationship, may it be that you pursue without ceasing as God demonstrates to us that He pursues without ceasing. Hear this this morning. Because I want you to understand how much the Father loves you. And because He loves you this much and He has mirrored this to you, I would, I would hope that you begin to think about in your own life how you can pursue. How you can pursue. To get what you've never had, you must do what you've never done. If you decide and you want to have that deeper relationship with your spouse, I want to encourage you to start pursuing again. And if you've done things in the past, but you've slacked off on them, to get what you once had, you must do what you once did. If you are in that place, I want to encourage you to start re committing to your spouse. Revelation 2, 5 says, remember the height from which you've fallen, repent and do the things that you did at first. Go back to those things. Go back to the wooing. Go back to walking in the rain at 11 o'clock at night in the middle of the street, holding hands. If that's what it takes, if that's what it takes, if it means you're writing a love note on a sticky note for your spouse in the morning before you go to work, do it. Do it. If it means that you actually get up and wash the dishes for the first time in a long time, do it. If it means rubbing feet, man, that's real love right there. Do it. If you want what you once had, do what you once did. And to get what you've never had, you must do what you've never done. I want to encourage you this morning in these ways to pursue. You made a vow to put God first and your spouse second. I want to encourage you to make a vow today. Make a vow today to pursue your number two. As I was listening to Mark's message, I was um, thinking of something I actually shared with the, the volunteers this morning, and I want to quickly share it with you. Um, do you. How many of you wear glasses, contacts, or have had LASIK surgery at some point? Anybody? Okay. When I was uh, 17, I was senior in high school, I was sitting in a chemistry class, and there was somebody... Um, and and I, I turned to the guy behind me and I said, this teacher has the worst handwriting of anybody I've ever seen. I can't even read what he's saying. And the guy behind me said, you need glasses. I can read the board just fine. And I was, I was shocked because in my world, the professor or the, the, the teacher was the one that was wrong because I only knew what I could see. That was wrong. I also want you to know that as a driver, I thought they made the signs too small for all of the, um, the street signs. I thought, that's ridiculous. Why don't these people know to make bigger signs? You guys, we approach marriage that same way. We look through the lens of our existence. We look through the lens of our history. We look through all of that, and we look at our spouse, and we say, well, don't you know how to do that better? Because that's ridiculous. Don't you know how to, because that's, I can't believe you're not. And I remember the day that I put, got glasses, all right? So I walked out of the, uh, the eye doctor place, and I put them on, and I remember going, you're supposed to see leaves on trees? Those signs aren't as small as I thought they were. I don't wear glasses now, because I have, I had LASIK, so I had to, you know, improvise, but that's the thing, and, and so that reminded me of Jesus' glasses. That every single one of us walk in this life without glasses on. And we walk in this life with our own perspective and our own upbringing and our own history, our own personality, our own everything. And what Jesus does is he says, here, let me help correct your vision. 
I want you to see things the way that I see them. I want you to see people the way that I see them. I want you to see the world the way that I see them. And humility is, a, is accepting the glasses from God and putting them on. And the only way that you can accurately pursue your spouse, like Mark is talking about, is if you, like they have been demonstrating for us, passionately pursue your number one so that he can give you the correct frame and the correct lenses to look at your spouse. Because if all you see is yuck in your spouse, and if all you see is disappointment, you have the wrong glasses on, and it's your problem, not theirs. Because you're not wearing the right glasses, and you're walking around blaming the world because you can't see. They have shown us what it looks like to passionately pursue number one, and as we do, we put on the right lenses I hope you can see this worship team with the right lenses on because that's what they just did with us. And I hope that you can see one another in this church with the right lenses because even in their brokenness, even in our brokenness, there is something incredibly beautiful that Jesus wants you to see about other people, but you have to be humble enough to say, I need glasses and I'm willing to put them on and use them. And you have to do it in your marriage. You have to do it in your relationships. You have to see Jesus the w- or see people the way that Jesus does. Otherwise, we will continue to blame the teacher for his terrible handwriting and the sign makers for making the signs too small. So Jesus, we want to come to you and we want to thank you, Lord, for what you have spoken directly to our hearts today. Father, forgive our pride. Forgive our pride at thinking that we are the ones that see the world correctly when it's you who sees this world correctly. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive me, Lord, for my arrogance in believing that I know the right way and and I'm positive it's the way Jesus would say to do it. God, I can only look through my lens. I am helpless to see people without your help. I'm helpless to see Mark the way that he truly is without your help. God, I pray for the people in this building right now that you would give us eyes to see. You would give us the correct prescription that we would be willing to admit that we can't see quite as well as we think we do. And may we humble ourselves with one another, apologize, for, shine, for just seeing with our own eyes and begin, God, to pursue you passionately so that you would give us the correct lenses, the correct prescription, and the correct understanding as we pursue our number two. And for those in this place who are not married, Lord, I pray that they would begin to see everyone in they, that they are in relationship with, with your lenses. God, we all need your help. And I thank you that you are always willing to give it. May we receive it, and may we live with the correct lenses on.